Okay, so good morning, everyone, once again. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it is a great honor to open this series of talks. They will be monthly talks. Um, and we, we are calling it uh, Reading in Interfaces, uh, Theories, Methods, and Applications, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the postgraduate program in English. Uh, which was founded in 1971. And I think we do, although despite everything that is happening in the world now, I think uh, academically we have a lot to celebrate. Uh, we have uh, 560 MA thesis defended in the program, 560, yes, and 176 doctoral dissertations defended. So we do have a lot to celebrate. And this virtual event is organized with all the support from um, our postgraduate program. Uh, we thank Harissa for taking care of the platform and everything. And uh, by now, Nucleo de Estudos en Litura, the group under my coordination, and also Genk, from PUC Rio Grande do Sul, coordinated by uh, Lilian Cristiane Ugne, uh, Grupo de Estudos em Neurolinguística e Psicolinguística. Yes. Uh, so we would like to thank Professor Ladislao Salmidon for accepting our invitation, sharing his expertise in the area here today with us. Okay. So we are also on YouTube. So thank you very much, those people who are there. And I'll now just give the floor to my colleague Lilia Ugne, who will just say a few words too. <laughs> thank you, Leda. I'll be very quick. So first of all, I would like to thank Leda for the invitation to organize this this uh, uh, this event. Yes, this joint event. And uh, it's a pleasure to see meeting all of you here today and people on, on YouTube. Uh, so this will be the first of a series of uh, lectures. And uh, the next lecture will be, it will be a monthly uh, event. So next month uh, on the 15th or 16th April, still to be scheduled, uh, we will meet uh, Professor Sandra Aloisio from USP. She will be talking about machine, machine learning, about techniques uh, to assess language automatically. Uh, so on how to simplificate, to summarize text, for instance, which will be very helpful for the clinics, for research, and also for uh, preparing tasks for assessing reading comprehension, for instance. Okay, so it will be the next talk in, the, in April. And in May, we will have Professor Marcel Just, who will be talking a bit, uh, one of his latest research on the role of hippocampus in learning. So how learning, which is basically or mainly uh, brought about by reading. So how learning affects the structure and the complexity in hippocampus. So this will be uh, one of his topics uh, in May. So wel welcome again, Professor Salmeron. It's a great pleasure having you here today. And thank you for everybody who's giving support to this uh, event and for everybody that is watching us. Thank you, Leda. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lilia. So, uh, Professor Ladislaw Salmeron is a full professor at the Department of Developmental and Educational Psychology at the University of Valencia in Spain. He holds a graduate degree in science from the University of Colorado at Boulder in the USA, and a PhD in experimental psychology at the University of Granada in Spain. He is the director of the research unit on reading, Edi Lectura, at the University of Valencia. His research interests include digital reading comprehension, the effects of digitalization on reading, and critical reading on the internet. So for sure, we are going to 
have a very good time now listening to uh he likes to be called Lalo, Lalo Salmedon. So thank you very much once again for having accepted. I'll just ask the, the audience to place uh, all the questions um, in the chat here at Zoom or on YouTube, and they will be answered later at the end of the talk. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll now close my camera <laughs> and I'll let uh, Professor Salmedon take the floor. Okay, so welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Lida. Uh, obrigado. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry that uh, I can understand a little bit of uh, Portuguese, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it's a shame I have to, uh, to speak in English with you. But uh, anyhow, I hope uh, we will. Uh, uh, I'm definitely going to enjoy uh, the talk, and I hope uh, you can also uh, um, enjoy it yourself. So thanks, uh, first of all, Lida and Juliana, uh, Lilian, for, for the invitation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really honored by, <laughs> by being the first um, um, speaker in such a nice, uh, interesting uh, set of uh, talks we are organizing at, uh, at uh, the lab. So I'm, uh, yeah, I hope that uh, for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, you will um, uh, get some, some interesting ideas from, from our side. Um, I will be preparing, I'm not so familiar with uh, Zoom, as uh, this is not the, the kind of uh, tool we use in Valencia, so I will ask you please to let me know if you can see the slides in uh, five seconds. Uh, that should be... Yes, perfect. Okay, that's perfect, you can see. And, uh, and this as well, so transitions are yeah. working. Good, thanks. So uh, the talk, uh, today's uh, talk, I'm, I'm going to be presenting a study, so it's going to be a kind of a classical talk. Uh, it's about um, how can we use uh, eye tracking tools to um, try to understand uh, uh, digital reading, and not only try to understand, but uh, even more importantly, how can we use it uh, for the purpose of uh, teaching students how to uh, properly navigate and properly uh, not only navigate, but to read uh, digitally. Before going into detail, just as uh, Lida mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm from the University of Valencia. Uh, so I'm the director of this research institute on reading called Eri Lectura. And uh, basically this is uh, a structure that was, um, um, that started 10 years ago, uh, created within, uh, um, the University of Valencia as a set of different groups from the different disciplines, from psychology, which is my background, but also we have colleagues from philology, linguistics, uh, or uh, education. And uh, the main goal is to foster the scientific study of, of reading. And we also work a lot on transfer. So we work with uh, libraries, with a uh, teacher, with policy makers, mm -hmm trying to boost the scientific knowledge of, of reading into real practice. Um, I, uh, more concrete basis, I'm part of this uh, uh, digital reading group, but we, we have several others from a group that uh, just focus on really basic uh, tricholinguistics with uh, EEG studies, fMRI, to a, a different group that specializes on uh, uh, library. Um, uh, promotion of reading in libraries, so it's kind of a kind of a broad uh, interest, all focused on, on reading. So, um, and you have the, the 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 link over there. So, in case you, you want to take a look, not now, <laughs> later. So, uh, going back to uh, to the talk, just a brief uh, introduction. Uh, I will be talking about digital reading, yes, but this is so broad, I could speak for months, so I will have to narrow my, my um, um, uh, exposition to uh, um, a particular aspect of digital reading, which is information evaluation. This will come uh, in a second. Later on, I will try to uh, give examples of how can we use uh, the eye tracking technique to study information evaluation particularly, and um, how this can be linked to, um, to the interventions we know already 
after uh, having the news for the first uh, information evaluation and also I will uh, then move to um, to send you the study in which uh, we combined information from uh, eye tracking studies to the to first this uh, um, sub process of digital reading this is this uh, Acronym M stands for Eye Movement Modeling Examples. This will become a little bit more clear uh, in the talk. And I will just end up with a few comments in the future, leave uh, some room for, for questions, discussion afterwards. So, uh, first of all, when I uh, when we speak about uh, digital reading or reading literacy in general, and, uh, we like to frame our studies on, on uh, this is a kind of a traditional framework, the one by PISA or Catherine Snow by, uh, from Harvard, which basically uh, considers that um, uh, reading or literacy in general can be uh, decomposed in three main uh, aspects, uh, which you, what they call access and retrieve, which is this, uh, uh, the ability to identify main ideas on the text or in the text, in the case of digital reading, this uh, ability to navigate through and locate relevant information for the purpose of your task. But this is not the only thing we do when we comprehend, when we read. Of course, we have to identify the main message or, or even details of the text. Uh, second or different aspect, it's this uh, integrate and, and interpret. Uh, which is uh, conveys the ability to uh, link different ideas into a coherent model, uh, and also um, link these ideas what with what you already know from the world, from this particular topic. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, digital reading, this is particularly clear when we um, read different documents, and then you have different opinions on, on a particular topic, and you have to integrate this. Um, and so there might be uh, different ways to do so. I will discuss briefly uh, a couple of them, uh, but then you, you can easily imagine how this becomes far more complex than in, in traditional reading comprehension, uh, where we usually are restricted to a single text. And then, of course, you still have to integrate information from the text or pictures to the text. You don't have to worry about all this uh, piece of text um integrates with the rest of uh, documents available for, for the time then a third aspect still it's not this is not a pyramid this, this is quite a complementary aspect but not many students kind of uh, reach or even uh, think about this uh, this uh, third aspect it's what um, pisa calls reflect and evaluate this is the ability or the skill to uh, go beyond the text, try to understand which are the author motives, uh, try to understand to what extent what I'm being told is true or not, or to which degree I can trust this information or not. So in a way, this, uh, this helps um, the reader not only to understand the text, but to uh, position uh, herself within the text and then decide if uh, she will or not use this um, information in the real life. Yeah. If you don't trust that information, then you will easily discard it. Otherwise, you will use it to um, uh, support whatever decision you have to make or whatever uh, action they uh, think about. Like, uh, so polemic topic, this issue of vaccinations. We are now uh, facing um, this in Europe. With a couple of days ago, this uh, new vaccine by the Oxford University was uh, stopped. It claims of it's not fully safe. Then you have scientists, uh, and even the World Health Organization claiming no there's some evidence of a causal link between these potential problems and the vaccine. Then you have the media and uh, Twitter accounts saying, oh, this is not really safe, they want to kill us. Yeah. In those particular scenarios, it becomes clear that you not only need to um, access information and find relevant information through navigation, 
not only that you have to integrate, but it's been told that also you have to reflect about what's going on here. What, uh, what should I trust in this particular case? So now I will narrow my focus on this last uh, part of uh, digital reading. And um, I'd like to uh, frame this uh, as um, when we uh, uh, read on the internet and we, on, on, uh, we have to uh, uh, reflect and evaluate information we face both uh, challenges, but also this potentialities that uh, the internet offers on a more positive side. Uh, the internet offers, uh, offers access to multiple perspectives on different topics. And I think this is uh, something extremely valuable and rather unique of, uh, of digital reading. So this idea that you don't have to uh, just to stick to a particular um, a perspective, opinion, uh, uh, even text, uh, like uh, uh, Lillian referred before to this uh, particular text to know from a topic, okay, you don't have to uh, limit yourself to what you immediately have access in paper. You can go beyond complement, uh, contrast. Another thing is that if this is common or not, <laughs> but uh, this is something that, uh, yeah, that potentially we could use the internet for that uh, particular uh, purpose. Yeah. We could exploit this uh, positive aspect. But on the other hand, it, it, it also poses some challenge. Uh, at least in my view, uh, important challenges. Uh, probably the most important one is that the internet does not offer any strong editorial um, uh, gatekeeper like you could find on uh, any journal or uh, even the book companies, uh, publishers, they will uh, edit whatever they publish. So traditionally, uh, the editors will, uh, or libra librarians will uh, keep uh, readers safe uh, in terms of the quality of what they are accessing, they're reading. Okay, this is uh, lacking on the internet. Uh, so basically now you not only have to read, but you also have to be your own gatekeeper. Uh, so once you log into the internet, uh, either you want it or not, um, uh, such responsibility now relies on your shoulders. And as we will see, this is something not every student is uh, willing to do or able to do. And of course, this is, a third, uh, this is related to, to this aspect. As long as you open the internet so anybody can publish anything, um, becomes obvious that then the quality of the, of the sources you may find vary a lot. You may find a really an expert account on whatever topic you think about. And then at the same time, with the same format, uh, in visually similar um, formats, you may have uh, information from really untrustworthy sources, so sources that don't know much about the topic. They are not even neutral on the topic, so they are biased. Uh, but you can say so. Um, so then it's uh, it's up to the reader to decide. Okay, which uh, should I consider not only the content itself of the text, or trying to go beyond and reflect on this. So these are the challenges that um, that we face when reading uh, digital information on, on the internet. And uh, these are particularly uh, um, relevant when we learn about uh, controversial topics, uh, which are these uh, issues that have multiple and competing views and that require students to make a judgment about what's, uh, what's true or what's more, um, which argument has more support. Yeah? So I will not claim that um, once you log in, in on the internet, you have to be always uh, alert for any kind of uh, search or password and records. So for simple, simple facts uh, checking, like what is the capital of Brazil? I mean, nobody's gonna lie about that. I mean, so I search the internet, I will just blindly go to the first link that uh, Google gives me. There's no reason to think uh, anybody will lie about this. 
more basic um, facts that uh, you want to go from one place to another or uh, so what is the population of um, Valencia. Yeah. But when it comes to uh, so, uh, pro uh, controversial topics, uh, you can think of uh, any kind of like this issue of vaccines. It's extremely uh, controversial. Uh, but uh, you name it, could be any political um, um, topic, could be a uh, climate change or any kind of derivation through climate change, any topic with uh, hidden uh, uh, or over economic uh, interests, uh, like uh, uh, the use of technology for education. Is this good? Is this bad? You know, these kind of more complex topics than um, the issue of. Uh, being a good evaluator of information becomes uh, critical. This is an example of the kind of um, uh, a scenario we use with uh, our students. This is about um, transgenic food. Um, these are two uh, pages. We, this is one, some of the real pages we have used in the, in the current study. Um, this is the World Health Organization. And then you can see um, at the bottom, you have information with uh, some source information. Uh, on the right, you, you have this uh, director of health, uh, uh, maybe um, environmental health of um, World Health Organization. And on top, you have a, a kind of a personal block, like a personal statement, the topic is. Uh, this particular topic, it's uh, um, interesting because there's no black or white. You can have uh, uh, really good um, uh, points to support genetically modified food, such as uh, its capacity to uh, provide food for large populations. Uh, but then you have you can have concepts like uh, related to um, uh, potentially uh, harming other uh, crops, non-transgenic crops. Some people may argue that there may be some uh, healthy uh, health related problems. So, with this in mind, so this I'm talking about this kind of topic. And what would, what do we know of uh, what students do? What we know is that uh, both high school and undergraduate students uh, are not really um, equipped to cope this kind of uh, situation. Uh, one of the, uh, the major challenges, it's what uh, colleagues from Germany, Mark Stadler, um, have pointed is uh, at some point, when you uh, face a task such as reading about transgenic food, if you're not really an expert on the topic, then you don't really have the prior knowledge necessary to, um, uh, to identify which claim has a better support from science. So then you cannot really say what if it's true or not. It, everything may sound true if it's uh, well argumented. So then in those cases, which are um, uh, a majority of cases, you, you, you learn when you don't know much about the topic. If you already know, if you're an expert on transgenic food, you don't go and read this blog. You don't really need it. Yeah. So in the absence of prior knowledge, then you have to move to what they call, okay, to not what is true, but um, uh, who I trust, whom I do believe. Yeah, and it's this uh, uh, tone that then makes you aware of the need to identify what makes um, um, a source more or less reliable, more or less uh, trustworthy. For example, identifying how much knowledge does this person has, or a second point would be a, um, is uh, uh, she neutral or not? Unfortunately, what we know from uh, uh, both right tracking and also studies that have used uh, think aloud protocols where students have to uh, reflect what they are do doing. We know that uh, uh, students rarely consider uh, source information uh, either to um, uh, to click on more relevant information or uh, or look at this uh, particular information, not only for that, but also in terms of using. So when you have to provide a recommendation for your mom, 
uh, which is an uh, eight year old with uh, only primary education. And then she asked you, okay, should I vaccinate or should I be reluctant to vaccinate with the COVID? Then a use here will be okay. After reading, I decide I will use this information to uh, recommend my mom to vaccinate. Yeah. But students tend to fail both to look at this information plus using it. Um, and this is particularly relevant in, uh, in, a, in a specific context of digital reading, which is uh, uh, we call source uh, engine research pages, which is basically Google. Think of Google list. Yeah? Why this is important? Basically, because most of our interactions, uh, or, or most of the starting points of our reading episodes, begin with uh, Google. Yeah? So in a way, Google it's a uh, it's kind of the uh, the gate that uh, um, gave us access. Uh, to, to information and gates, because can be a, the way the gates are designed may also shape the way we uh, um, we access the information. So, uh, in the case of uh, Google, uh, which are the main characteristics of um, of the way this uh, gate is um, organized? Basically, as you all know, uh, Google provides you with a list of um, of results, but this, this should not be universal. Now it's universal, but uh, you might recall at the beginning of the internet, uh, where, when Google even did not exist, like Alta Vista or other browsers will use um, uh, kind of grids of results instead of a list. Yeah? Now lists ha have become ubiquitous. So, and an issue with uh, lists is that uh, um, it's easy to uh, interpret that, okay, uh, the rank order equals um, relevance. So then if Google, then people may think, if, if Google ranks this as the first option, then that should be good. I don't have to worry about even to look at, at the other options because Google has already ranked it on the first, uh, as the first page. Yeah. And this is of course problematic because it, 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 it uh, uh, leaves, it gives the responsibility to, uh, to the system and not to you as a uh, as reader. What we know from uh, from uh, eye tracking studies is that um, this idea that people tend to look and to select mostly uh, results which are ranked on the top of the of the Google list. Um, we know, for example, uh, in uh, Pan and colleagues, they found it already in 2007. And um, um, this um, bias towards the first three links, visual bias and also the clicks, the first three links, will, um, uh, will still appear, even though in conditions where you reversed uh, the order in which uh, the Google provides the results so that you get the less relevant results first and the more relevant results at the bottom, still people will uh, blindly look uh, mostly at the first uh, links. You can see this, uh, say I will go uh, to that in a second. Uh, for example, in tasks such as uh, there's some ambiguity, like in this case, okay, find the home page of Michael Jordan, the statistician, not the basketball player. Yeah. So in the regular, what they call normal condition, which is how the regular Google will provide the results. You see the, the green bar, it's a percentage of uh, participants who look at the snippet. So the first three, you see that first, oh, it's almost 70%, then the third, only 40% look and then basically nobody. Uh, and when it comes to clicks, this is the the dark um, bar. It's uh, basically 70% click on the first. This is okay. You may think, okay, yeah, but Google usually works. This is correct. But what happens in the reverse condition, which is on the right, you have a, a rather similar uh, profile. So even though it's not so relevant in this case, most people will 
still focus on the first three uh, four uh, links. Um, this is uh, this some um, uh, further studies on this uh, idea of what it's called usually Google Trust uh, heuristic or list uh, heuristic. Um, even when you manipulate all the source features from the snippets, such as uh, Uncle, they have used um, scenarios such as uh, this, uh, like, okay, how many animals does the zoo in Magdeburg has? And they manipulated, uh, for example, the source trustworthiness on top of uh, others. So you may have uh, uh, that the most trustworthy link will be uh, the fourth, and then the first link will be something really untrustworthy, like uh, the personal block with a really non good looking name. Uh, people don't care. People, they will just go straight to this uh, first link. Yeah. Uh, so it's highly prevalent as uh, opposed to other um, snippet uh, characteristics such as uh, the URL uh, or even um, the, the message it itself of. of uh, of the title provided in the snippet. The snippets are this, uh, you know, the whole uh, information box you get from Google Shopping to say in Google. Yeah. Just uh, before I proceed, this is uh, the kind of a more visual output you get from eye tracking studies on, on digital reading. This is not, um, uh, to be honest, this is not the kind of data then you later use. It's, uh, it, but visually, it really works to convey your message. Yeah? So basically what you can see here, it's at the more red uh, spots at those, this is aggregated data from, from different participants than the most. Red points uh, mean that the more, the higher percentage of, of participants have focused their attention on that. And you see it's usually this F shaped kind of uh, figure that most people look at the first they don't even read the whole thing. I mean, it's just, uh, you can see if uh, the sentence is like this, they only focus on a couple of first uh, words. Yeah, so it's not even real reading. They say, okay, I go for the first, okay. Then they seldom go down. In the, the, in the real analysis, and you, you, will, you will usually go a little bit uh, farther, as I will, as I will show. Like uh, having indicators of, uh, of uh, the time transitions and so on. So we get the point. Uh, usually, what we will do is this: uh, we will treat the gate, gate gatekeeper of all information as if everybody everything was uh, equally valid. Yeah. Uh, and why? Why I like this uh, potential explanation by Epstein and, and Robinson. They say, okay, but. People uh, in their routine uh, searches, uh, the, the most common one, it's the uh, simple facts. Uh, and then, uh, of course, for, for those tasks, Google works really well in terms of providing the best, the, the best fit of your query. So that, in a way, people are, after some experience with uh, Google or any kind of uh, web uh, search engine, they get used to just uh, the, why should I uh, worry if Google does it for me? Yeah? So you get the impression that Google is always right. Yeah? And as we, uh, as we discussed, this is not always true, especially for more complex and controversial topics. Yeah? In this sense, uh, colleagues like uh, Winnebow, they have uh, um, recommended to work with the, uh, in the strategies, what they call, uh, for example, click restraint, which is this uh, process of spending some time on, on the list, on the SERP, uh, before clicking uh, away. Yeah. So just, okay, just before clicking, let's read a little bit of what information does uh, Google offers. And this is a huge difference when you compare, for example, professional fact checkers with users. So professional fact checkers will spend less time within the pages, but more time in the Google list. Uh, and the same is true for expert versus novice uh, students. So more expert people tend to spend more time on the Google list and a little bit less on, on content. Um, 
US lobbies, they just go straight to the company. Even though we know that because they don't have enough knowledge, they may not be able to fully um, evaluate if this was an agent. So then, uh, of course, the, the, the main uh, uh, point here is that if we have identified an important aspect that it's not fully uh, developing the students, nor high school, nor undergrads, then there have been uh, several attempts to try to uh, um, support this uh, uh, acquisition of those skills. Um, this is a nice review by colleagues from Norway. Uh, and usually uh, the way this is taught is by providing uh, sweet thought prompts. Like uh, this is from Keen and Hanafin. Uh, okay, you uh, let the students read and then they have to um, uh, answer those questions as they proceed. Like some aspects of reliability, like currency, is this, uh, this a recent site has been updated or not? It's an old one, so you cannot really trust. Uh, there's no new knowledge that may um, um, qualify the claims, even here. Uh, number two is information based on scientific evidence, uh, authority, and so on. Yeah, so this is a classic way of, uh, um, of interventions in this, on this topic. But what Helge Stronzo and colleagues in the review uh, identified this, a couple of limitations we wanted to address in, in our new study. Is that, uh, none of these intervention study had measured how actually students um, uh, search for, for source, source information during, um, uh, during reading. So basically none of them used uh, eye tracking. So you, you see if they have improved in their uh, essays or whatever measure you have, but you don't really have a cue about if, uh, if the process itself really uh, um, really improved. Yeah? And then a second limitation we wanted to address is that um, those um, uh, guidelines are usually uh, way too uh, general. You say, okay, attempt to source information. Yeah, what this really means. Uh, is this looking at this uh, person, looking at the, uh, the title of, uh, of the person with its occupation, or what this really means. Yeah, so um, what we like from eye tracking and a particular method of eye tracking is that you can guide uh, visual, the student's visual attention to those aspects, but so you are particularly critical. And this is what we do. Um, we uh, um, basically took a uh, uh, particular, um, particularly interesting um, a method, the uh, instructional method. Uh, it's called eye movement modeling videos, which are basically videos that um, present the uh, learning task. And then on top of it is um, superimposed, you have um, dots moving, which represent um, the eyes of uh, usually an expert student. Well, so students have to learn in students, they just have to watch those videos as uh, how a really good model does the task. Yeah, this has been used uh, traditionally. This was uh, uh, proposed by Halska Haroska, a colleague now in Amsterdam, uh, for. Uh, mostly perceptual tasks such as uh, this is fish locomotion for biology um, uh, or um, the uh, medical tasks such as uh, identifying if a baby, a newborn, you know, you have to uh, hit him or her on the knee and then look at the, the eyes if there's some kind of reaction. So when you teach um, uh, medical students with videos, okay, you see how the, how, the, how the expert does this, but you don't really see where the expert is looking. Yeah? So with these videos, then and videos you, you can do that. You can convey such um, information. Yeah? In, uh, in terms of uh, reading comprehension strategies, which is the most important uh, part for us, there's some ongoing evidence. This is mostly new that it, it could also be used, although reading is, strategies per se are not 
something you can easily convey in your eyes. I mean, it's nothing you can see. Uh, probably I'm reflecting, but you cannot really see that. So it's um, logic, it's a little bit different, but it can be used. Uh, for example, uh, Lucia and Amazon, they have used it to model um, the strategy of integrating information from text and pictures. In the example on the bottom, so they uh, provide this kind of video to uh, these uh, high school students. And uh, we know that, that the strategy of moving from the text to the picture, it's more beneficial in terms of learning that the strategy of just reading the text and then look uh, as a picture, as an isolated entity. Yeah? And then, so this is a large potential with this. We have used it in the context of digital reading uh, to um, uh, teach uh, navigation strategies for uh, high school students, with particularly with ninth graders, which is uh, uh, in Spain, the 14, 15 year old. No, uh, no, no uh, older, sorry, like 15, 16. Yeah, upper high school students. Basically, what we model with these videos are strategies such as, okay, when you read in Wikipedia, this was the, the scenario we used, and then uh, we model studies such as looking at the table of contents before uh, going into the text, or uh, reading the headings of the subsections um, before skimming the text to identify if this was relevant or not. Yeah. And uh, with those videos, we were able to, uh, to improve the students' uh, navigation in terms of, uh, um, uh, kind of the relevant um, pages, relevant in terms of useful for the questions that they had to answer um, from pre to post to a control group. Uh, Harry. So there's some evidence that this could be useful in our case. Then what we did, um, and this is uh, now the study, is to uh, take this idea of uh, movement modeling examples uh, to try to uh, um, teach information evaluation on the internet for two uh, undergraduate students. Uh, I will show you in a little bit more detail, but basically we, the main question was to try to, to see to what extent with these videos we could uh, improve not only the, pro the, the product, but also the process. Um, so, what we did is uh, to test um, 64 undergraduate students, uh, mostly third and fourth year. Uh, in individual sessions of, of uh, 90 minutes. So we run this uh, pre-post design. Uh, this was one condition and uh, within subjects and then between subjects, half of the students um, in the middle, I will show you in a second, use these uh, M's or watch these M's and half of the students watch a uh, control videos that have nothing to do with the strategies. And then we use uh, a uh, portable eye tracker, which basically stands uh, at the bottom of the screen to capture students' uh, eye tracking, both at pre and post test, so we could compare the evolution of these uh, indicators. So this is the procedure. You, uh, it's a little bit difficult to convey in one screen because this was 90 minutes, but the, um, first we uh, control for prior knowledge and interest tests, then students um, uh, have a limited time to read the uh, web pages on, we use two topics, uh, genetic modified food and, and climate change. Um, so we told them, okay, now you have to read this, uh, um, about this uh, polyme polyme you have heard about uh, genetic food, about the pros and cons, and later on you will have to write a summary. Yeah. So during the reading phase, their eye movements were recorded and then um, during the writing phase, again, it was limited, but then there was no, no idea in this case. In the middle, between these two pre-post um, scenarios, they uh, uh, either watch the M video or the control videos. Uh, 
so what exactly those uh, videos, those M videos um, look like? We use uh, specifically five that corresponded to five uh, theoretically relevant uh, to the strategies that expert students apply when uh, evaluating information on the internet. This one was about um, this idea of uh, the full inspection of the uh, Google list before proceeding. So students will just uh, watch a single screen of a Google page and then they will see the dot reading everything from top to bottom and even reading something before clicking. Yeah. Then uh, video two will be a uh, identification of source information within a page. So once a student is in the page, they will see only like uh, the one I saw you of World Health Organization, the student will read the logo, will read the source information, then only that will go into the, um, the content and, and read it. Uh, maybe just a, a different example. Um, uh, we also model um, uh, reading depending on uh, the quality of the page. So in the video three, students entered a web page which was highly unreliable. It was a forum about uh, random things, not a serious scientific uh, page. And then the, the model the student will first look at the source and you identify that this is not a serious source. And then she will quickly skim the text. Yeah, this is a, still you, you look, in case there's something relevant that because you identify that this is not really trustworthy, then you don't really go through in detail. Yeah? You, you want to be efficient. And then we do the opposite. In a different video, you see, okay, this is World Health Organization, then I read and then I even reread some parts. Yeah? Uh, I could uh, use a video, but then I fear that things will <laughs> collapse. So in case it's not necessary, you, you just think I mean, these are not really uh, uh, complicated videos. Right? Uh, you imagine a screen and then the video, uh, the dot, sorry, moving. Um, I, uh, as I say, uh, this is a, a kind of uh, screen you will see and then and now the dot is at the bottom, but then you will, uh, a real video, you will see this moving around, basically. As I mentioned, we use two, two different uh, topics. Each topic has uh, four web pages. Two of them were um, pro with arguments, pro topic like pro um, transgenic food or pro use of uh, renewable energies to fight climate change. And the other two were against. And then uh, two of the pages were from highly trustworthy which was the organizations like World Health Organization or FAO, United Nations. And the other two were less trustworthy, either commercial ones like uh, Monsanto or uh, Iberdrola, which is kind of a huge uh, Hispanic ele electric company, or because of, uh, in this case, there's commercial interest, or in case of a uh, block, personal block. Yeah, we are not really trust that the knowledge of this person is good enough, right? Um, reasonable arguments, yeah? So it's, uh, everything was counterbalanced. And then this is the main scheme we used for the analysis of the results. First, we will focus on to what extent um, all manipulation had an effect on the way students pay attention to the source indicators. And then we will try to model to what extent this has an influence on the essay quality. I, I can anticipate that this this was not the, the effect was not so nice on essay quality. But uh, attention to source characteristics, as you will see, it was strong enough. So this is the first um, uh, result. This is about um, uh, reading times on the SERP. So basically, we took all fixations. So fixations, it's one of the main indicators of uh, eye tracking, which are basically the time um, which uh, the reader process reading information. 
you may already know, maybe I should have gone into this, but you are mostly master's students, PhD, so I assume you have some basic knowledge on this. When we read, it's not, uh, there's not, not a continuous uh, flow of information. So we have saccades, uh, which are these um, points where you capture information. Then you have to move your eyes like these jumpings. Um, um, so the fixation and then the saccades are the jumping, sorry. And when you make a saccade movement, basically your brain is blind, so you don't see anything. Yeah. So then we took this reading times, which is not the total time because you, you cannot claim that when you move your eyes are reading. So it's only the number, the amount of fixation time on this the initial page of uh, Google. And basically what you can see, it's this uh, kind of a medium size um, um, effect. I will go straight to the, to the interaction. And then what you can see, the blue line, the control group didn't change too much from pre to post test. Why? I mean, it's just uh, topics are quite similar. So basically they spend uh, on average the same time. But uh, the control group, uh, sorry, the M group, which is the red, a line you see is a steep increase between pre-test and post-test. Basically, uh, meaning that they um, increase almost a uh, double, not really, but uh, to, uh, almost two thirds of the increase on the reading times on, on, on the initial page of uh, Google. So it's this idea of Winneburg of uh, like, uh, restraint. Yeah. So apparently for this, it's uh, working, or videos are working. Then a different indicator was uh, we look once the students were in the in the web pages we look at uh, um, how much fixation time was on the um, web page header times the headers are the logos on top of the page. Yeah. Basically here we found a main increase from time so at pretest um, uh, the attention to uh, headers was lower than at post test. But this uh, happened for both control and M. It was, not, not, it was mostly related to the task, not uh, to our intervention. Then for page author information, this um, uh, includes uh, uh, how much time students devoted to the picture of the authors or the information about um, the occupation commercial director of Monsanto. Uh, then again, we have um, a small effect, but significant interaction in the expected way. The blue line does not change from pre to post test. The M group improves. So um, spends more time reading such uh, author cues. Then uh, for me, a little bit uh, more interesting is this, uh, uh, we look at uh, the reading part. So taking uh, the text uh, of uh, these uh, pages here were about 250 words. So we look at fixations on the, on the content part uh, and, and then dividing between trustworthy or less trustworthy pages. Yeah. Remember that they all convey uh, important information. This is, it's not that the untrustworthy information say uh, really uh, unscientific claims. No, these are well argumented, but they come from biases or non-knowledgeable sources. So you should not uh, uh, pay as much attention uh, to them. And then what we found it was a um, nice uh, three-way interaction between uh, trustworthiness of the page time, pre-post test, and uh, intervention or control. Let me guide you a little bit. So on the left uh, panel, you see what happened for the trustworthy pages. There's the control group for the blue. Again, there was no, no difference in terms of average fixation duration on, on words. Um, they did not change. Whereas the intervention, uh, the M group, uh, you see increased in their average fixation duration. So they read for longer those trustworthy pages. Yeah. 
is uh, mean 250, around 250, 200. It's uh, kind of the average time uh, adult readers spend on each word. Yeah. Uh, this might not be the case for other languages, but for Western languages like Portuguese, this, this, this is uh, English, this is usually uh, the rule. So uh, what you see is that they, those students were uh, more strategic after watching these uh, M's. They spend more time reading the trustworthy and the opposite happened for the less trustworthy pages. Again, the control group did not change. Yeah. They read at the same speed rate but those in the M then went down. So they pay less attention to those uh, untruthy pages. And uh, finishing a little bit of time. Sorry for that. Then this was a nice story. Then the not uh, so uh, uh, sexy story is um, what uh, when we analyzed the essays of the students, we did not find ma major differences. In some, as well, as, uh, as I will show you. We uh, identify uh, first the content uh, indicators, that's uh, what we call single paraphrases, like ideas, single ideas coming from the text, how many of them. There was no main uh, change. Then we look at uh, how many um, intratext inferences, so how many ideas were combined. Yeah, with from uh, from one text again no major difference between the control or m and the same for intertextual ideas so how many ideas were combined from a text uh, with one opinion and from another text with a different opinion yeah on average they use only one text um in this case one one per scenario but no major change then we look at the source indications, so basically citations. They refer to uh, according to Monsanto, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this will, uh, this is what we call a document source, so a citation, and then embedded source will be uh, not the source of, of, not the author, but uh, somebody who, had, who was mentioned in the, in the text. Like according of one study, published by researchers from Harvard, blah, 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 yeah? And basically what we found that this was a, a first message, this was rare, so it's not common. Here this uh, 0.5, for example, a pretest means that only five students out of 10 mentioned at least one, um, cited at least one the source in the, in the essays. And the only thing we found was this, um, for the M, M group, there was an improvement in the probability to cite uh, document sources in the essays. Okay. This is the first step, but definitely not a major change we were expecting. So uh, finally, we made a little bit more complex model in which we try to relate both eye tracking indicators, uh, uh, essays, and basically what we found is this uh, uh, indirect effect of um, uh, SERP reading times, which mediated the relationship between the M, so the intervention, and this uh, um, document cited in the summaries. How you uh, uh, read this, this is uh, read uh, 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 as a consequence of being in the intervention group. You spend more time reading uh, on the SERPs, and due to this, you um, increase your probabilities of citing the documents in your essays. Yeah? This is uh, the mediator model. Um, so these are the results. I just need a couple of minutes to conclude. So basically what we found is that with this really short five minute uh, intervention with a video, so nothing really complicated, we, we were able to um, um, increase the undergraduate's attention to uh, self information, to author information, but not only that, not only being uh, pass passively looking at information, but also behaving strategically in terms of uh, how much attention was paid to less or more trustworthy pages. Yeah, so this, uh, all data clearly shows this. Then in terms of uh, uh, how this then transfer to a product, 
uh, all this uh, source information was used, and we found only limited evidence that such uh, short intervention had an effect on, on the quality of the essay. The only uh, um, aspect improved was this uh, the probability of citing at least one document source. Yeah. But at least was the first step. Uh, so we can conclude that these uh, M's uh, are um, useful uh, uh, instructional technique to uh, uh, foster uh, information e evaluation on the internet, and particularly to foster this uh, strategy of uh, uh, restraint. Um, and then it, uh, all data, I think they also make it clear that, that uh, when we speak about information evaluation on the internet, we should definitely pay attention to how um, um, students process uh, Google information. So this uh, search information. Not all studies take into consideration this aspect, which is essential in uh, whenever we uh, we learn from the internet. Many studies just only look at what happens once you're in. And as we saw, uh, this initial step is uh, even more important. In this case. And then uh, last word on the uh, final uh, future directions we like uh, to take. Okay, we, uh, we acknowledge that this uh, usefulness of this uh, in terms of uh, the output was not the uh, best. Uh, so uh, we're thinking about ways on how to improve um, the um, uh, transferability of these results. Uh, so that students could even write better arguments, learn more, uh, so to say. So one of the ideas we have uh, thinking about for the future would be to include uh, together with the videos. Videos here were only visual, so there was no verbal information whatsoever. Yeah? Uh, then one way we think we could, the effectiveness of those videos could be improved is that we include um, verbal explanations. So kind of the, 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 the reasoning, uh, the students are following when they when they read those um, those sources, um, and then this way you could convey not only what you are doing but also why you are doing this. Yeah, uh, so that could help students to transfer that uh, uh, model strategy to them how to use it in, uh, when reflecting and learning. Then another option we're thinking about uh, is uh, potentially complementary. It's this idea of um, asking students to do something with the, with the videos. In our study, we just told them, okay, now you have to watch the videos because this is a good student. Uh, but of course, you can imagine that the kind of engagement students, uh, the degree of uh, to which the students engage in this active processing of the videos may be highly uh, variable. So a way to, uh, to kind of uh, foster students' engagement will be, um, for example, to use this technique by Chi and McNamara, is this idea of uh, self-explain the ends. Okay, you have the video, but now tell me, why do you think those students are behaving that way? Yeah, so uh, by doing that, we, uh, we expect that the students may incorporate also um, to a higher degree. Uh, the strategies um, uh, used. Yeah. So that's all on my side. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm sorry, I'm not so sure it was in time, uh, but uh, now I can say I'm done. If you uh, want to take a look at the more details for the study, it was published last uh, December. You have the reference here, or you can uh, email me or, or Juliana. We will uh, be happy to, to share it with you. So, uh, thanks again. And uh, yeah. We're looking forward to your input. Okay, Lalo, thank you very much for the very nice and inspiring talk. We have lots of questions. So uh, I will call the, the moderator for your talk, Leonida you Procailo. I'll just introduce her briefly. So Leonida has a PhD in language studies from the Federal University of Santa Catarina. In fact, from uh, our research group, MEL, Núcleo de Estudos em Leitura. She got her MA in Linguistics from the Federal University of Paraná. And she's currently uh, 
uh, an adjunct professor at Unicentro, which is a state university of the Middle West here in Brazil. And she has experience in both Portuguese and English language teaching in elementary schools and college. And her main research interests include uh, reading in L2, reading in digital literacy, strategies, and inferential processes, and also English language teaching methodology and teacher education. So I'll let uh, Leonida proceed and she will tell you about the, the questions and how she wants to, to do this with the, the audience. Okay, so thank you very much, Leo, for having accepted this invitation. Okay, thank you, Leda. Good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be back to Uski and to talk about breathing. Uh, and it's an honor to have you, Professor Samaron, sharing a bit about your research and that of your group. Uh, I would like to thank the audience on YouTube for, for making the comments and for those in, the, in this room. Uh, and I will proceed with the first question from Professor Claudia Winfield, which uh, asks the following. I would like to ask which eye tracking tools the speaker recommends to individual researchers? Uh, okay, so this is quite uh, an open uh, question. Uh, first of all, I will recommend that, uh, that this is a guide of thumb. So uh, whenever you do your research, you have your research network, you know what other people do. Uh, you read what all the studies look like uh, your own and then I advise you to look at what kind of equipment do they use yeah, because in terms of uh, practicalities it will help a lot if you have uh, your own task but you know that there's some other lab that is using the same equipment and has worked for them then you you may contact them there's some kind of uh, uh, difficulties linked to, to your task it may uh, um, uh, have been experiencing it, it really depends on the task if, if you are more interested in to I don't know web study so you're going to use the real internet then the kind of equipment uh, better equipped to do so may be different if you are just interested in more static uh, pages or if you prefer your, your, your research goals are videos for example so you have a, a moving uh, item then uh, the, the software provided by, by different companies may be more or less um, helpful in this uh, regard. Yeah? So this is more like a, the, the general rule. And then, uh, of course, it may depend on your budget first and then uh, um, the requirements of the task. So usually if um, the major change in the in the quality of the equipment or of the commercial companies, it's uh, in terms of uh, it's the kind of the, the speed of of the eye tracking, uh, um, uh, this, how many samples per second do you get? And when we um, work on breathing comprehension, for example, this this is not a major limitation. So you can work with a lower sample like 60 Earth, 120, 200. That's perfect. But then um, for some tasks in psycholinguistics, uh, like where you are really interested in not only the more broad and reading of sentences, but uh, specifically words or even esteems within words, then you may need uh, far more precise uh, and far more extensive uh, uh, eye trackers. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, again, it may change. It may be different if you are targeting six year old or um, undergraduates, yeah, in terms of uh, you may need uh, chin rest for the first, for the, and then for not for the others, yeah, so there's some, um, there's a lot of variability, but I will not recommend it. It's, uh, this is some uh, really cheap um, equipment going on, you can buy in China for 100 euro, 200 euro, and uh, this, uh, from the point of view of the hardware, this may be okay, I, I'm not claiming this, this will not uh, work, but then the, the, the most problematic part of eye tracking in my experience, it's um, the, the analysis. So uh, 
from, from the hardware, you get this uh, f flow of uh, millions of uh, data rows, and then you have to make sense of this. Uh, starting from um, identifying what's a fixation and what is uh, a saccade. This is the basic. And, um, uh, and this is uh, in commercial companies like uh, Toby or uh, iLink I, I from the US or, or others. They, uh, the, the software they have, they have been trained with the real, they have a mathematical model of the eye and so on. So this makes, this is done automatically by the software. Uh, and it has been highly, um, so you can trust it's highly reliable the way it's. Uh, so if you are, but, but again, if you are just interested in, uh, no, it's in a study in which I want to see if the, the baby uh, looks at uh, the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen. And I don't care if it's a fixation or not. Then a 100 euro uh, platform will, will, will do the job. Yeah, this is why my early recommendation was okay. Try to, depending on what you do, look at what other colleagues around you uh, do, and then go in that direction. That's it. Okay, okay thank you. The next question comes from Daniela dos Santos, and she is uh, she wants to know what are the eye tracking measures that you use to understand how the participants have read the Google search page. Yeah, so basically, um, sorry, I should have gone into much detail, but uh, as you realize, I tend to speak too much. So I, sometimes I need to, uh, uh, yeah, I take for granted things that uh, should not. Uh... So basically what we did, and this is the way you usually proceed in this kind of a study, we, um, we divided the, the web page in regions of interest like uh, little boxes uh, and it's similar to when you have a, if you have a long text, you will usually use uh, paragraphs or if you use long short stories, then you, you will have sentences. Or if you would say psycholinguistic study, you will just, your regions of interest would be words or esteem. So in this case, we have this, uh, uh, each uh, snippet was, um, region of interest and then we look at uh, two indicators here i only spoke about time but usually you have so fixation time how much time was devoted uh, each time the student fixated their eyes into these uh, boxes and then you usually uh, divide it by the number of words so you can then compare this is the, the data you saw and then we also collected the number of fixations which is highly related, but it's how much detail was uh, given in each of the of, uh, areas of interest. Yeah? Then uh, you can go a little bit, uh, you can do more complex analysis, such as uh, looking at the transition between those, uh, looking at uh, if some of the snippets were given more attention than others, such in the PAM studies I discussed in the introduction. What you saw is the, is the average. Uh, okay, we have five more questions. Is it okay? <laughs> Can we move on? For me, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe if you tell me to speak up, I can speak up. I am happy to, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's move on. So the next one is a, it's a question by Lillian Hubner, right? And she uh, starts with a comment. These results and discussions are very relevant and should definitely reach schools and universities. Does your group plan any action under this translational perspective? Yeah, so on the, on the, on the first part, so in, um, um, we uh, have um, with colleagues from Norway, we have, um, um, we are planning uh, a project in which we will um, work with this, uh, this uh, methodology of EMS, not only for this aspect, but for other uh, aspects of digital reading, like uh, navigation, also integration of multimodal information. Um, and then our idea, it's, uh, to, um, to create modules that can be um, 
incorporated into uh, high school students' uh, curriculum on, uh, on reading. Uh, and, uh, what we like most of this uh, approach uh, is that, um, uh, you know, this, this is uh, highly, uh, because you, you can tell that it's just video, so it's not reading. You know, I don't know in Brazil, but all students don't like reading. So but if you tell them, okay, this, no, it's just a video, so it's not, there's no bar this barrier of, um, of uh, reading. But this is one of the positive aspects of the uh, ends. We expect that they, this will uh, be um, received positively from, from the students. Yeah, so this is something we have uh, in mind. Right. And uh, Professor Lillian also asks um, and comment starts with the uh, pre and post testing regarding reading assessment. So then the question is, what are the measures you normally take when controlling for text balance? Uh, again, text relevance. Uh, text balance. If I can just uh, con conclude, uh, um, like uh, there, uh, as you mentioned, you control for interests and background, background knowledge. And I think that Sydney and Tatiana asked something in, in this way. Um, so we know that uh, previous knowledge may uh, may bring some differences in the way people approach a text or a video. So how, how do you try to control for this background knowledge when you compare results, you know? It, do you, I think it's, it was their question too, yeah. So yeah. how do you correlate this previous knowledge or interest? Yeah. Or, yeah. Because this pre and post testing sometimes it's for me. It's a real challenge, you know. I don't. Sometimes yeah. I don't know how to balance this. Yeah, yeah. There's no. Uh, I, I fully agree. There's no. To my knowledge, there's no uh, easy way to do that. So, what we uh, not only try to correlate and use them as covariates when needed, but we also. Um, uh, I didn't discuss this for the, within the design. What we did, it's. Uh, um, like fifty percent of the students first watch um, in in pretest they uh, they, uh, they read the, the text on transgenic uh, food and for the post text the um, genetically modified no no uh, sorry the climate change but then fifty percent did the reverse so the pretest was the climate change and then the post test was the genetically modified food. This is a way it's not perfect uh, but, but this, it's a way that you don't have like the most appealing text at post-test or vice versa, yeah. But, but I fully agree, it's not, it's not releasing. So in our case, we try another strategy we use to try to narrow down the kind of uh, prior knowledge. So we don't use topics. Uh, in, in other studies we use, for example, uh, learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Because then we expect that for all population, you will have Students that, that have a lot of knowledge, you know, from psychology students and some that they have. Uh, so in this case, we try to use uh, topics that we know for sure that, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's uh, definitely something uh, you have to look at. Otherwise, this is uh, just noise in your data. Thanks. Okay, I think that um, this discovered also the questions by Sydney and Julian, right? And then we move on to the last question that Sydney also uh, posted here. Uh, he asked, have you conducted or do you know any eye tracking study that has compared less and more proficient readers ability to identify relevant information in text? And uh, uh, the next question is, would it be the case that low proficient ones or resorting more cognitive resources to low level reading processes take longer to analyze text reliability. Okay, so these are two uh, important questions. So the first part, um, the issue of, uh, of relevance and text relevance and how uh, eye tracking can inform about this. This uh, a series of studies by uh, Johanna Kakinen from uh, Finland. She's uh, an expert on, on reading, uh, uh, on the use of uh, eye tracking, and they have this um, 
a series of studies in which they manipulate uh, text relevance as uh, aligned to task uh, demands. And they uh, look at um, uh, eye tracking indicators. So for example, uh, uh, fixation duration in each um, segment, the, ten, uh, the more or less relevant segments. Uh, for example, the kind of task they used, uh, I don't know if they use in Brazil or not, uh, but the one that came to my mind is that this uh, text uh, about two different countries, no, Honduras, I think it's Honduras, uh, two different countries like Honduras, the climate is blah, 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 but then on uh, um, Australia, the climate is blah, blah, blah. And then the text goes like this. Uh, so half of the participants say, okay, now you're planning a trip to Australia. Yes, uh, uh, go ahead and try to pick as much information as you can. So the, what you can see is that whenever Australia comes, then uh, the, the, the students uh, uh, slow down the, the reading. Uh, so this is kind of, it's a classical way of manipulating relevance, which is not the uh, importance, which is a different aspect. Uh, within the text, you can have more important ideas or uh, you ask about uh, relevance. Um, yeah, so they have they have worked a lot on that. Uh, and then the other aspect, I'm not so sure. Yeah, and I'm not uh, familiar. I will, so as uh, Lillian mentioned, there's some evidence that uh, prior knowledge uh, plays a role in, in the source evaluation uh, and also uh, more sophisticated epistemologies, such as uh, students who have uh, the beliefs that uh, science is uh, created by a dialogue and so on as opposed to students who think that science just come from the mouth of scientists. Um, so, but um, in terms of uh, reading comprehension skills, I will definitely expect uh, that, uh, but I'm not so sure if this, uh, the, the, the limitation to evaluate information will mostly come from a limitation to un properly understand what's been uh, on it. So then I'm not, uh, I don't think, should have to double check it, I don't think that there's much uh, studies on this. And then if there were, I will be suspicious and I will try to crit critically read the, the, the studies and try to see that if they have disentangled uh, comprehension of the, of the message, let's say, and then from, um, from the proper source uh, evaluation. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and again, it, it may really depend on the task. It's not, uh, we have used in, in the past in some really simple scenarios to work with uh, children, like a 10 year old, um, like uh, forums on the internet. Let's say Pablo says this, and then Isabel says uh, that. Yeah. Um, so, so these are ways in which you could create the scenarios where comprehension of the message is not, not so difficult because it's just a, the simple sentences, like a WhatsApp uh, discussion. Um, but then as long as your text uh, requires, which is the kind of text we usually use for learning in sciences, then yeah, it, might, uh, it might be difficult to disentangle both. Yeah, but that would be an interesting uh, avenue. Okay, and going back to Juliana's question again, I think, um, a lot of us are interested in the L2 reading, so it's a very good question, Juliana. And she's asking, was L2 a variable in these studies or uh, is L1 used an issue to be considered, especially in this fraction modeling phase? So again, I'm sorry, I missed the part of the question. The question is, uh, was L2 a variable in these studies, L2? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Most, um, I'm, I'm not, uh, so I would say 99.9% .9 of the studies in, uh, in uh, information evaluation have been uh, conducted with uh, L1. Um, this a few uh, with L2, I'm now thinking about uh, with a colleague from uh, linguistics in Castellón, but uh, she has mostly looked at um, uh, not from the learning perspective, but from uh, communication perspective. So she has used uh, studies like uh, Twitter um, discussions with uh, some messages coming in Spanish, some messages coming in English. 
yeah and then uh, but particularly reflecting on a highly specific effect which is this uh, emo uh, emotional reaction you may be uh, more familiar than i mean in l1 when, whenever you're told uh, like bad words your emotional reaction it's uh, higher the, the arousal it increases as compared to the same message provided in l2 especially if you are not uh, bilingual uh, uh, then this emotional um, words the 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 arousal activation uh, it's a lower and then uh, uh, then to be uh, more specific uh, what she did um, it's uh, agnes uh, san pietro what she did is um, these uh, messages could convey information such as could, uh, could be like uh, all these uh, issues about uh, climate change this is crap uh, you should not uh, uh, listen to these people um, climate change does not exist yeah and then she will compare that uh, to uh, messages um, more polite that we convey the same information and say okay i'm not uh, so sure about this i will rather pay more attention before like in l1 or l2 and what uh, she found is that uh, uh, those emotionally charged uh, messages had an effect only in L1. So in L2, uh, people will mostly um, uh, react on the message, but not on the emotionality of the message. Yeah. Again, this is a, a at least in our context, in the European context, it's important. I'm not so familiar with uh, Brazil, but I can imagine that because. Um, uh, many people read in different languages, you know, so you get information from uh, in Twitter, from uh, in English, or in our case, it could be Catalan, Spanish. Um, uh, and then the way you you get involved with the, with information may, may may vary depending on the language. Uh, so apart from that, uh, I think it's a, a thing lar largely uh, unexplored, or oh, probably you know more than. Sure, not that I'm familiar with. Okay, uh, I also have a question, Professor Lalu. Uh, I've been reading um, your your research and your, your your group's research, and I would like to go back a, a little bit to discussion, um, which is maybe in our country is um, it has gained more prominence in the last few years or in the last few months because we have this distance learning phenomenon uh, and uh, we hear uh, students and people in general complaining the difficulties that they have reading digital text right uh, comparing the, the imprint and on-screen reading uh, can strategies from imprint reading be transferred to on-screen reading uh, should we consider differences between an adult reader and a young reader? Okay, so this is, this goes beyond this. Uh, this uh, yeah, yeah, so we have been uh, interested also in this other aspect of um, the differences between print and, and digital. And overall, we tend to find that uh, surprisingly for me, I'm um, I come from a digital studies, so uh, what we was surprising that people not only prefer the people from from teenagers to elderly prefer to read uh, on paper but also when you look at uh, carefully the experiments that have been done comparing people tend to comprehend a little bit less not too much but a little bit less in digital than on print um, so your your point was about the uh, difference between uh, young and adult uh, students. Um, in, in this case, I, uh, for me, it's not so easy to, uh, to uh, um, I don't think we can um, separate, in this case, age from cohort, from generation. Uh, why? Um, for me, when, what we see in, in this, uh, we did a revision and meta-analysis is that uh, this difference between print and digital, it's becoming more problematic now than 20 years ago. 
So it's it's totally the opposite as those uh, digital gurus claiming that uh, well we are all digital natives and then uh, there should be a convergence at some point. And if if you are better on paper, it's because you are an, an older immigrant, digital immigrant, and then it's uh, your problem. And new generations will not uh, find it different. What we found is just the opposite. And so for me, it's not just a matter of young and old. It's about uh, 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 what we did 10 years ago with digital technologies. So 10 or 15 years ago, let's say 15 years ago, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no cell phones, uh, smartphones, sorry. Um, uh, there was no uh, this infinite uh, scrolling that um, that you see when uh, you read the now on whatever, bbc.com, and then there's always more and more information. So there's no end. Uh, and all these uh, kind of new ways in which uh, digital information is conveyed, which are now fully uh, um, prevalent, um, the argument is that they make us uh, um, uh, they make us relate with the digital information in ways in which we want quick access to information. Uh, our attention has become highly reduced because. We get uh, uh, wants all the time to click more, click here, click there, uh, new messages. So in a way, the state of mind that we um, have created when working with uh, digital tools, it's uh, in a way incompatible with this more relaxed reading comprehension of uh, two pages of text. It's, an, it's not uh, digital per se. I don't think it's, there's anything wrong with digital. It's the kind of the way we, the, 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 in, in 20, 2021, uh, we tend to relate with this. Uh, and uh, because uh, kids uh, have been uh, raised with this kind of uh, a scenario. So they use uh, with the tablets and then the tablets all the time that you have all this uh, pops up and you have all these messages coming on. Um, my fear is that they may not, uh, if not, but uh, properly on how to uh, avoid distractions, uh, how to uh, train the focus, uh, then we, we, may, we may be in a risk uh, once they, they become adults. And we have seen, I as a professor, I have seen this uh, in my students that every year they complain more and more about readings. So, oh, this is too long. Why don't you give us some short story? <laughs> or, and in a way, it's a fight that, okay, if, if you uh, provide, let's say, 10 readings, and then 50% of the students won't read them, what do you do? You, you cannot, at least in our system, you cannot say, okay, you 50% failed. Then it's a battle. Then, okay, next year I give you only eight. And then 60% complete. So, uh, I'm particularly worried about the, 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 the kind of... Um, um, interactions we are promoting with uh, with the digital world. Um, but this is a highly open question. I mean, it's not, uh, this we, we could discuss this for for hours. I'm uh, particularly uh, worried about this. And when, one thing we, we want to convey also in this and in other projects is to uh, train students just to stay focused on reading. Like uh, some colleagues in a, in a high school we work with um, in the suburbs of Valencia, they have implemented this system, which every day students have to read for 30 minutes. But the whole high school, so from 12 to uh, 16 year old, uh, from 12:30 to one, uh, everything shuts down. There's no uh, voice on the background. There's no, and they just have to read. What? whatever they bring, they, they, they have the school library, but they could bring the comics, they could bring whatever, yeah? And then the goal is that they, they may uh, at least be aware that, um, okay, there's an option, there's uh, some reality out there, which is 30 minutes being focused um, on a task, and then ideally you, you will, uh, they will then transfer this, uh, uh, this will be in uh, the ideal world. But I, I really think that the, that um, 
of course, we, we cannot change this, the dynamics of the digital world. This is out of our control. But, but then what we could do is at, at least on top of this, uh, we should then uh, create the necessary conditions for that, uh, uh, that kind of practice of long uh, read uh, sessions. Yeah, because otherwise there's no warranty at home when uh, there's some nice, uh, and this will be, I promise, my last words, some nice uh, studies in the US with uh, uh, multitasking uh, at home with some, some kind of uh, service. And we know if you multitask, so you, if you do two things at the same time, then pff, you don't do anything, not, not the one, not the other task. And then they, they ask uh, uh, adolescents, okay, when you read at home, how often do you uh, listen to music at the same time? Watch videos at the same time, which I don't know, how can, how can you really do that? Well, and then the percentage, it's uh, amazing, 40%, 50% of students claim that, no, no, you're at home, when I read, I have this, uh, um, whatever, Netflix in the background. Uh, then and this this is the real problem. So that that we uh, um, that the new generations may not have uh, the opportunity to practice uh, as a fully uh, episodes of only reading. Uh, and I think this is something essential that we have to uh, promote. And it will definitely pay off in terms of they will be better readers on the internet. They will be better. So it's not the black or white. But I think it should. Uh, we should definitely pay attention. And just uh, in, in the practical terms, then I will suggest that from time to time to your students, print your um, your text and then shut, shut uh, down any device and devote some, some time to this silent uh, reading. I don't know, what do you think? I'm, I'm quite uh, curious about this. <laughs> You, but I'm surprised that, that you 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 raise this because it's something we also have been experiencing uh, here. This kind of uh, uh, digital fatigue. Yeah, very very nice discussion, and uh, especially considering the pandemic uh, time, right? That we are more exposed to digital reading, and then students uh, usually. Uh, comment and complain that uh, this sudden change from print into digital is something that is difficult to cope with. Um, so thank you, Professor. Um, uh, thank the audience You're welcome. For, the, for, for the questions. And obrigada, equipe, né, que está fazendo, tornando possível esse evento na equipe tecnológica da universidade. Que, que nos proporcionou esse, esse encontro virtual, né? E em outro momento, talvez fosse um pouco mais difícil de, de nos encontrarmos, but we hope that Professor Salmer can maybe in the future come and uh, join us here at UFSC, and then we can have a discussion on... We could go hours Hopefully. and hours talking about this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry it took uh, probably longer than expected. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I hope... Uh, uh, yeah, it was okay. It was uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, so as, Le as Leonilda said, we could stay here, you know, just asking more and more questions to Lavo, but I think it's really time for us to <laughs> stop here. And I think this is going to be there on YouTube. Yeah, so if you want to access this later, if you missed something, uh, if you need a certificate, I think you can, the link was here, but you can always ask us. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, Lalo, Professor Lexlau Salmeran, once again, for having accepted so promptly our invitation to open this series of talk. It was really nice listening to you and seeing, you. you know, some things we do here uh, in our lab. Bruno de Azevedo is uh really his experiment is i think almost ready now to be piloted just uh, uh in multitasking 
reading a text and listening to to music at the same time with li lyrics without lyrics so we're very curious to <laughs> see what is going to to come from that so yes. thank you so much uh i think Lilia would like to say i would like to thank the audience here at zoom once again and also on youtube okay so thank you, Lilia. <laughs> I think you should consider also the rhythm of the music. <laughs> because people may try to yeah, dance definitely. while yeah, reading. The BPMs, yeah, there's so many things yeah. to control. Many variables. <laughs> Very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. We, have, we are experiencing that, you know, designing the, the experiment, right, Bruno? <laughs> okay, so um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. I'll just stay here as one of the hosts. So <laughs> I hope you have in yeah. Brazil a nice lunch. I think Lalo for you now is mid afternoon, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, coffee time. Yeah, okay, coffee. <laughs> all right, here we're going to so have. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.